y'all. Coming up next to the microphone, gonna introduce your feature this evening. Put your hands together for Quiet Storm. What's up, guys? Wow, there's a lot more people than I thought there was. I was sitting at the front table, so I can't really see everybody. But, uh, yeah, this feature that we have tonight has not been on our stage for at least three years, maybe more. Um, but you guys are in for a real, a real nice treat. Coming up to our stage, Coco Flo is a feisty, unapologetic, and enlightened poet, writer, and speaker hailing from the small city of Owensboro, Kentucky. Coco attended Kentucky Wesleyan College, where, where she received a bachelor's in computer information systems in the University of Cincinnati, where she received a master's in health informatics. Lyrically, she is a roaring lioness, and her ability to be both down to earth and exacting is displayed whenever she speaks, whether on stage or on the page. In her free time, she partakes in mentoring college girls and speaking at different schools, organizations, and workshops. Her goal is to encourage others to act, think, or heal using her own story as an, as an example of what God, faith, and perseverance can produce. Coco is also the author of Twitter, Finger, Twitter Fingers, a collection of tweet-inspired poems and thoughts, which I hear she has merch tonight. So, without further ado, please welcome back to the Dayton Poetry Slam stage, Coco Flo! Woo! with words so superb that now they want to be in conjunction with my verb forget what you heard because you can't believe half of those silly sounds anyway sounds haters make when they spread in these half truths about me like butter but won't dare utter their issues to my face they mad because I'm out here making these oceans they swim in look like ponds gracefully stroking in this poetry game like the swan I am so ethereal with beauty and brains out here showing these players how to play the game with strength and tenacity and if you ever in Charlotte just ask for me and someone will direct you to this distinguished diva with a power and presence on stage like a pride of lions in a cage and I've only touched the surface of my potential this equation here ain't got no subtraction in it so the order of Operations from the most high got the devil plotting on how to add a minus sign. So divine, fine with time like wine. Blackberry, I am Coco. Calmly ooze in confidence, others adore Coco. Counseling other creatives on annihilation. Coco, capable of commanding outlandish audiences, and some people still can't stand me. So I tell them sit down and fall in love with this Coco until I burst in lyrical lines laced in chocolate. Just love this Coco. Confident, optimistic, creative outspoken, ambitious, flow, I am Coco. What's good, y'all? What's good, Dayton? I am so excited to be uh, home in one of my many homes, Charlotte, Kentucky, Cincinnati, Dayton. All of them are my home, so I'm so excited to be here with you guys tonight um, and to share. Um, as she said, I do have my book, Twitter Fingers, here, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, um, but you can purchase it, and I'm trying to let y'all prepare your hearts, your minds, and your pockets, because it's $20. Um, it's so reasonable. Exactly. I know y'all got some money. Payday was Friday. So, uh, as, as, as you guys know, I am uh, Coco Flo. And um, I'm excited to be here, and this is a participation sport, all right? You feel me? I'm gonna give y'all energy, and y'all gonna give it back to me, all right? I, I'm only as good as the energy y'all give me. It's really that simple, so if you hear something you like, I wanna hear you snap, clap, yell, hey, Coco, go girl, do that, whatever, right? Um, so tonight, we are gonna talk about uh, my therapy journey. I'm so excited to talk about it. Uh, you know, especially in the black community, it's really taboo sometimes. Um, so I'm so excited that God gave me the opportunity to go to therapy um, and to really work on myself. 
Um, so as you heard, I am from Owensboro, Kentucky. Um, I'm a product of a single parent home. Um, so my father was not present when I grew up. And as a child, you don't really know, um, you don't really know what that's about, right? You like take it in and you're like, they're not present. So you, you kind of um, internalize it and you start to think that it's something that has to do with you or that you're not good enough or all these other things. When in reality, that person is an adult who made their own decision. It has nothing to do with you as a child. Uh, but you don't know that, so you grow up, you, you take it in, and, and you really start to think that maybe something's not right with you, maybe you're not enough, um, and all those things. And so my friends ask, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Without hesitation, I said, invisibility. The power to go undetected by the unaided eye has always been an intriguing trait. Found myself in girly Fantastic Four and Sue Storm's ability to disappear. But I was familiar with invisibility long before watching Sue vanish. You see, invisibility, it was my father's most notable trait. Nobody knew how to hide in plain sight better than him. See, there is no other superpower I'd ever been more cognizant of. As a child, books were my sanctuary. and them, I found a place where I could imagine up a present father, but could never really find him between the pages. Hit my teenage years and conjured up another notion. Thought I might be able to find a glimpse of him in each boyfriend if I held my legs wide enough. Safe to say, I never found him. He remained concealed, simply relinquishing his supernatural ability when it was convenient for him. Only as an adult did I realize his ghostly nature was caused by the pumping of powerful potions into his arms. They took over his senses. Then he'd go missing for years at a time. It's funny that I would grow up to be called Coco. Only I understand the irony in knowing that I wasn't the Coco he was in love with. Couldn't understand the phenomenon he was. Started looking to science to investigate invisibility and his connection to my father's vaporous ways. Science says, in order for an object to be considered invisible, it must do two things. One, it must be able to bend light around this self-casting no shadow. My mother, she radiates, shines so brightly the sun looks to her for warmth magnetic energy. Her spirit draws out the darkness, she wrapped herself around him, covered him in light. The combination produced two shadows, but he learned how to bend the truth, found a way to walk away from his own silhouette too. It must produce no reflection. He walked out the door, never to return the same way, didn't contemplate the consequences of leaving a daughter to mourn the loss of a father who wasn't dead. I guess, I, I guess that's the definition of being unreflective. I guess I found the scientific term for his condition, but still. My heart would never let me give up hope that one day he would reappear because my faith taught me just because something isn't visible doesn't negate its existence. Thought the only repercussions of his constant concealment would be the lack of connection to him. But I found my cup running over with issues. Tell me, how could I know how to trust men when the first man who held me in his arms dropped me, left me unattended, floating in thin air? He put up a force field strong enough to keep the love for him out. Now I have trouble being committed to a man because I'm afraid one day He'll pull his superpower out and it will look exactly like my father's. Never knew there'd be side effects. So on second thought, I'll take my answer back. Because now that I think about it, invisibility ain't that super of a power at all. Yeah, so, you know, I went to therapy, found out I had an abandonment wound, and I was like, yeah. That was that man, that was his fault, right? Um, but, but once you know better, you gotta do better, right? Um, so you find out where your, where your uh, thorns are, you figure out how to heal them, uh, or you figure out how to work uh, within those parameters, right? Um, and you keep it moving. Um, so that's one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite poems, but also uh, one of the things that I really learned in therapy that was that root underneath there, right? You gotta dig that up and, and get it going. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to have the, uh, artistic expression to be able to write something like that um, and, and really share it with people because I know there are a lot of people who also have abandonment wounds, whether that's their mothers, their fathers, whatever that looks like, um, who can uh, relate to that invisibility. Um, something else that I really worked on um, in therapy is boundaries. Y'all, look how y'all looking at me. Y'all ain't got no boundaries neither, do y'all? Oh, okay, makes sense. <laughs> no boundaries. No boundaries. Um, so, yeah, so really working on boundaries, right? Because boundaries are important. Not only the boundaries that we have for other people, but even the boundaries that we set for ourselves. Um, 
we can only go out in the world and be great. We can only go out in the world and, and reach our full potential um, if we set the boundaries with ourselves and other people because we're teaching other people how to treat us. And we are about, the way we treat ourselves is a byproduct of how we show up in the world. Um, well, how we show up in the world is a byproduct of how we treat ourselves. Let me say that again. Um, and so uh, I, really work, I really start working on boundaries and really like digging deep um, and figuring out like what things do I need for me? What things um, am I willing to settle for? What things are okay, um, and, and that way it can articulate out into the world and to the people who are around me. And so I got some specific uh, boundaries that I have when it comes to men. Y'all y'all mind if I share them? Y'all mind if I share them? There we go. 11 things men should know about me. One, the way I choose to wear my hair, clothes, or makeup are in no way related to your overly unattainable standards of beauty. Unfortunately, I do not change my hair to appease you, and my choice to wear or not wear makeup is not dependent upon your approval. Your satisfaction is not important, nor is your opinion necessary here. You and your opinion can go play in traffic, too. I am big, bold, and beautiful, but I will not be your fetish. I know Drake fantasized the idea of BBWs, but let that be where it ends. If you aren't ready to make loving a big woman with a big heart a priority, exit stage left, because I will not be your undercover lover. You will not throw these curves into a closet. I will not be your 2, 3, or 4 a.m. secret. I will not be the girl you walk by when you with your homies. No, you gonna love these pounds publicly. Three. If you suffer from fat phobia, I will not accept that nonsense in this queendom. Despite what you've been programmed to believe, thinness does not equate to beauty. Thinness does not equate to healthy, and you will not police my body. I will wear crop tops, I will rock form-fitting dresses, and I will eat what I want. Four, my selfies are not for you. My posts are not for you. My social media is not for you. Five, I will love you with a love parallel to that of a mother and her child until you try to take advantage of me. Warning, taking my kindness for weakness will only set you up to be shark bait. Six, when I cry, it doesn't automatically equate to sadness. Sometimes I cry because I'm happy, like when I find wildcat boots on sale, or disappointed, like when I fall in love with the facade of a man. Sometimes these tears represent anger and the final straw before I do some left eye or waiting to excel type shit. Hashtag don't leave your lighter around me. Seven. Seven, I have the privilege of being a part of an exotic, elegant, and exclusive group known as black women. We are beautiful, we are brilliant, we are necessary. Don't debate me, debate your mama. Eight, I am strong-willed, but I have no problem being submissive. That's just a rumor these men conjured up because I did not submit to their foolishness. Submission is not a sign of weakness, but a true understanding of balance. Submission is a conscious decision, and I will only take my superwoman cape off for a man I feel is worthy of leading. Nine, I am ambidextrous, so you always have the option to get right or get left. Ten. Ten, I am my only competition and no one else. Who said it was cool to put your sisters down so that you could be elevated? There's enough room for us all to thrive and succeed. I know why the cage woman sings, but I am no longer confined. Eleven, the cocoa is not for everybody. I am a collector's item, a special edition, a rare star you only have the pleasure of viewing for a limited time span, an acquired taste that you can only truly love if you've experienced it. Listen, I always like to tell the story of how that poem came, so boom. I'm sitting in Chicago O'Hare Airport because y'all know them niggas is always late. Um, they're always delayed. <laughs> so I'm sitting at Chicago O'Hare and I get a text message um, from this guy and I'm like, y'all know the moments when somebody just got you fucked up? That's how I felt. I'm like, he got me fucked up. I'm going to write this poem, right? Uh, boom. Uh, 11 things niggas should know about me, right? And there you go. Uh, that's how we got here. Um, but like as, as much as I have been through in my life to get to a point to be able to write a poem like that, I'm thankful for those moments, right? Because those lessons are what grow, grow, have grown me. And um, I ain't gonna sit here and pretend like I hold my boundaries strong all the time. I'm sure it's about one, two, three, 11 of them things that uh, <laughs> I probably done slid on a little bit. You know what I mean? Except for you're gonna love these pounds publicly, because I mean, that's a, uh, 
Uh, so yeah, so um, I went to therapy and I really started working on my boundaries um, and I really started working on um, being able to show up for myself better with those boundaries. Um, but as we all know, uh, going to therapy or working on yourself, doing yourself work, um, it doesn't stop the trauma from coming, right? Trauma still comes, it still shows up, even when you're in the midst of your journey, even, in, even when you're in the midst uh, of working on yourself and going through, going through therapy. And so uh, when something like that happens, those traumas come, um, you gotta figure out how to use the tools that you already have, um, while also not running back to the unhealthy coping mechanisms that you may have had before, right? And so it's that line that you start to teeter, cause you be like, man, I could just go do this shit over here, this unhealthy shit, and it would feel so good. Um, but in reality, it won't. Um, but the, uh, the processing, the growing, the learning, it doesn't stop. It's a lifelong journey, right? So when something else happens, when trauma comes, whether that's a simple trauma or complex trauma, uh, you have to figure out a way to, to navigate that. And so um, in the midst of my therapy journey, um, I experienced sexual assault for the second time in my life. Um, so I am going to give a trigger warning because I don't want to trigger anybody, but this poem is about sexual assault. Um, but I experienced sexual assault for the second time, and while um, it was such a terrible situation to have to go through, uh, lightning striking strike the same place twice, right? You know what that does? Like once fucks you up mentally, but twice is like, now what? Um, I'm thankful because it, it made me garner a new level of self-love. It made me tap into the tools I had. It made me stretch myself, and it made me as a uh, recovering people pleaser, ex-perfectionist, um, it made me really focus in on Jasmine. It made me really focus in and be like, what do I need, right? I can't focus on anybody else right now. I gotta focus on me. So I'm gonna share this poem with you guys. In the criminal justice system, sexually based offenses are considered especially heinous. In New York City, the dedicated detectives who investigate these vicious felonies are members of an elite squad known as the Special Victims Unit. These are their stories. Boom, boom. <laughs> Law and Order SVU has 451 episodes, and I've watched every one, became a blatant binger, spent a surplus of Sundays holed up watching marathons. No matter how many times my eyes have laid hold to an episode, I still tune in like it's the first time. My friends ask, why do you watch that show so much? but my tongue has never been strong enough to tell them I can relate to the victims, that I know what it feels like to be fresh blood to a shark, that I saw pieces of my nightmare dancing between clips of a TV drama, especially in this one episode, where the vibrant young lady invites the charismatic boy over. The boy goes beyond her boundaries. Her nose evaporate before they reach his ears. Her resistance met with a war like wrath for five minutes too long until it's over, the camera zooms, and I see myself reflected in her eyes. Remember the moment my own confusion set in, and the vow I made to never vocalize the violence I endured. I kept my rape a secret. Too afraid to regurgitate my own truth, I let trauma have her way with me. Suppress the memories until I was comfortable enough to unload the luggage. But Detective Olivia Benson, she was my lighthouse, a glaring gleam in a galaxy of darkness. And on the days when my trauma decides to beat a jack in the box, I watch all the victories Olivia has won, all the women she's encouraged to find ways to press on. I found healing in watching her be heroine as she encountered the same fire that left me in ashes and never became consumed in its flame. She showed me that in a world where folks don't see the issue of Brock Turner's victim blaming or presidents who grab pussies, there has to be more real life Olivia's, more crusaders ready to cake for the casualties, more advocates, more voices for the victims, someone to remind us that we didn't ask for this, no matter what we wore or said or displayed and despite the circumstances, the feeling of guilt is never our burden to bear. 451. The number of episodes it took for me to stockpile the strength to share my story, to levitate out of my own ashes, yet there could never be enough praise on my tongue for Olivia. But I heard the best way to pay homage to a savior is to walk in their image. So I am no longer victim, but survivor, no longer bystander, but contributor. Found the ally hidden in the back of my throat, the asylum in my truth, the power in being the calm in the midst of someone else's storm. Now it is my job to be. It is my honor to be. It is my 
responsibility to be someone else's Olivia Benson. Bong, bong. Listen, trauma don't care how she show up and who she show up for, right? We all, we all experience trauma on one level or another. We don't get out of this life without it. Uh, whether those are simple everyday traumas or something that's more complex that you have to figure out how to break down. What I am thankful for is that uh, the second time around, I can see that I'm not a victim, right? That I'm a survivor. And now I have the opportunity to share my story. I have the opportunity to take somebody else by their hand and say, Hey, you right? Let me love on you through this trauma that you're going through in the same way that even though Olivia is a fictional character, right? Uh, <laughs> even though she's a fictional character, um, it really helped me press through. And so just imagine that you're just like, why the hell am I watching this show so much? I love this show. And then one day it's just like, nigga. <laughs> Yo, you watching her get justice for people in ways that maybe you haven't got justice, right? Um, and, and, and it's such a beautiful thing, but a part of my journey was learning how to process through that and learning not to make it about the other person, but making it about me. What do I need? How do I need to move? What do I need to get to the next level? How do I process that? How do I take in the triggers that I have? And so it's been a beautiful process, even though it's something so ugly, right? Um, it's been a beautiful process to watch myself grow and change and love myself deeper. Um, so yeah, I know I changed the energy in the room, y'all, didn't I? Uh, <laughs> All right, so something else that I've been working on in therapy, well, worked on in therapy because your girl graduated. <sighs> Listen, she ain't getting no more money from me. Uh, no, but it was actually really sad. I was like, oh no, I don't want to leave. You've been my friend. I'm paying somebody to listen to me every week. It feels so good. <laughs> and she was like, oh my gosh, you're leaving. I know I'm not supposed to cry. And I'm like, ma'am, I feel the same way. Um, but another thing that I've been working on, I worked on in therapy was anxiety, right? I found out that I was a very, a very anxious person. Um, so I walk into therapy um, and I'm like, hey, I'm here because, you know, I'm. I don't really feel that stable. I just moved from Cincinnati to Charlotte and like I'm traveling every other week for my job and I don't have any family here and I'm just really trying to figure out life. And so please, ma'am, just give me some tips and techniques so I can walk on out this door. Like there's nothing wrong with me. It's just that like, and then, you know, to then start peeling back the layers and be like, ma'am, you're anxious, chill. Like it's not that serious. Uh, <laughs> let perfectionism go. Um, so on my journey of learning about my anxiety, um, I started to learn tips and, and techniques that really helped me um, process those. And so there's this one thing that I really, really, really love doing. Um, and it really helps my anxiety. Y'all mind if I share it with y'all? Does anybody else in here have anxiety? What y'all be doing? Hold on, before we go. What y'all be doing for y'all anxiety? Yell it out if you want to share. Oh, meditate. Baby, I couldn't stay focused long enough. Drugs. Prescribed or unprescribed? <laughs> yes, so I found a way that I really enjoy. And so, maybe it'll help somebody else in here. Maybe it won't, but I'm gonna just tell y'all, it's all right. I can share. Y'all don't sound excited to hear my way. Can I share? There we go. Twerking is my form of resistance. You ain't know there's a revolution in this booty. A protest lives in these hips. Defiance dances down my spine. I try to sit still, but rebellion lives in my bones. Call me a freedom fighter. My body be my weapon of choice. Every time you see my hands up, body rocking, I'm fighting. Battling to break the chains bound by believers who hold standards on what black women should be, how we should carry our frames or how we should move our bodies. Watch me disregard your opinion. As I drop it like it's hot, pick it up then gyrates in all this black girl glory, but don't get it twisted. I be hybrid of Michelle Obama and black China. I am Coretta and Cardi. Back that ass up, be my war cry. And if you object to the way I, New Orleans, bounce this booty, well, that's your problem. 
Hell, that means you are the problem. Call me ratchet, promiscuous and unladylike, but just know twerking ain't never made me no less of a woman, no less of a guiding light, no less of a highway to heaven. Try to hypersexualize me, condemn me for the way my body moves when it hears a beat. But y'all love when Becky's no rhythm having ass, decides to repackage it, put a bow on it, and then do it on live TV. It seems to me it is only a problem when the body is brown. But this brown body here gonna dip these hips to make her ancestors proud. I got a movement to lead. And my body be a political art piece. And I mean, ain't this twerk as beautiful as a Picasso painting? And ain't these stripper kicks as graceful as Misty Copeland on tippy toes? Can't you see the Asada Shakur in the arch of my back? I control my body, and I won't let you muzzle my movements. Won't let your hate and turn me harlot, cause this booty pop be empowerment. It be a talk with God. I call it my sacrifice. Call it a step out of the margins. This is dismantlement. My attempt to decolonize your idea on black women. The closest thing you've ever seen to God. And the joy we find in using our bodies to love on ourselves. So call it healing. Call it liberation. Call it transformation. Or just sit back, shut up, and watch this revolution. I really do twerk. Like, I have twerk breaks during the day. I'd be like, girl, get up. Before you let these people get on your nerves, girl, get up. <laughs> get up and dance. Do something, ma'am. All right, pop your back. Um, <laughs> but I always laugh because twerking gets, like, such a bad rep um, when, when the bodies are brown and I can remember being a little girl, like dancing with my cousins, and it was always hip pops and, and rolls and all of that. And then you grow up and they're like, yeah, don't do that. And I'm like, um, <laughs> it helps my anxiety. It's a prescription. My doctor prescribed me to twerk. That's how I'm gonna start telling people. It's doctor prescribed. Um, mm -hmm. So really quickly before I get off of here, I do just want to talk about my book. So I have a book, it's called Twitter Fingers. Um, it's a collection of tweet-inspired thoughts and poems. And so last year was uh, a really weird year for me, a really rocky year for me. Um, but I realized I tweeted so much good stuff. Um, and so I was like, ooh, I should use this. Um, so what it is, is on one side there is a tweet of my own. Um, and on the other side there's poems, um, commentary, proverbs, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so once again, it's $20. You can feel free to get that. Also, if you want to follow me on, <laughs> it's ministry. Um, but if you can also follow me um, on social media, Coco Flow, C-O-C-O-A-F-L-O. Um, but before I get off here, so once again, I'm so excited to be here in Dayton. And so as I moved to Charlotte, one of the things that I learned, um, Cause first of all, I don't know if you guys know, but I'm like a five-time Dayton Poetry Slam champ or something. I don't know. Um, something like that. Yeah, like, like five. Um, but <laughs> but um, so I've been across the country and, and regional and national and just doing slams, but Dayton Poetry Slam is what really got me started. Um, and slam has been the door to so many beautiful opportunities, meeting so many beautiful people traveling the country. Um, yeah, shout out to slam. Like it gets a bad rep, but like also, it really opens the door. It ain't the bread and butter, but you know, it opens the door to other opportunities, books, voice work, like all these different things. So, um, so shout out to Dayton Poetry Slam. Uh, <laughs> shout out to Dayton Poetry Slam. Um, but when I got to Charlotte, I noticed that Slam was a little bit different. So here, I was used to seeing um, a lot more women hit the stage. Um, but when I was in Charlotte, it tends to be more male dominated. Um, and so for somebody who. <laughs> So for somebody who already struggles with their voice, um, it can be intimidating sometimes. Um, so I wrote this poem that I'm gonna share with you guys. Um, but as I was finding myself in SLAM, I also found myself individually, right? Um, and then also, as he said, I'm, I'm in tech. So people who look like me are few and far between. And so sometimes it's hard to really like speak up and tap in. Um, so this poem was birthed from those situations. There's this thing I do when I walk into new professional spaces. It seems weird to most people, but it happens quite naturally at this point. I look around and I count the number of women in a space. The ratio, typically uneven, has become the norm to me as I gaze around. 
I wonder if the women in these settings ever feel caged, chained to the standards of patriarchy. If when they speak, their voices get swallowed in a sea of baritone. I question if their spirits are draped in fatigue from fighting to fit into this boys club. There's this thing I do when I walk into a slam. It seems weird to most people, but it happens quite naturally at this point. I look around and I count the number of women poets in a space. The ratio, typically uneven, has become the norm to me. I see women who have found themselves in confinement, whose voices continue to be trampled on in a crowd of masculinity. I ponder if they ever feel alone, like I do. The stage is my sanctuary. Slam is my sport of choice. The place I come to shatter, to be my most authentic self, to show up, to share, to sacrifice. Yet I notice women don't stay in this sport too long. It's like our voices have an expiration date. Or maybe we get tired of turning up the sound of our trauma just to be heard at the same level as the men around us. We fight, hoping our femininity weighs enough and that we won't become just another woman's story swept under a stage, another film silenced by scrutiny and scores. I once heard a male poet say, Coco only scores well in these spaces because she's the only woman. As if I don't give y'all all this Angela Bassett for three minutes and 10 seconds every time, but I wonder if he knows how often I scream, where are all the women, only to be gifted back the sound of my own echo. I can't tell you how many times my feet have found themselves on the starting block, ready to sprint out of this lopsided scene. So I ask, where do women go to be free when even our safe haven on stages don't always hold space for us? How even when we find ourselves in slam surrounded by all women, it's hard to celebrate knowing that when it's over for some of us, it's back to male-dominated slam spaces. A sanctuary is never supposed to be a place you go to feel bound. It's supposed to be where you go to shout your way free. So it's time I stop running, stop being afraid, stop trying to play the background when there are stages with my name on it. Nobody can tell a woman's story but one, so I say fuck their scores. There are women out here looking for someone like me to relate to. The world has groomed us to be polite, told us be seen and not heard, but we are here and we will be heard. One or one thousand, our stories will continue to find their rightful places on stage. There's this thing I do when I walk into a space and see there's a lack of women's faces. I prepare my kerosene tongue, strike a match with my confidence, and burn that motherfucker down. Thanks, guys. Thank y'all, I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so for all the women in the room, every space you step into, burn that bitch down. You hear me? Tell them Coco Flo said it. Uh, but yes, yeah, so I'll be in the back if you want to purchase a book, feel more than free to. Also, you can come just fellowship with me, get my social media handles, all that good stuff. But thank you guys for being here, and I appreciate your time. Keep it going for Coco Flow! All right, here's what's going on. We're going to take a 15-minute break. We're going to take a 15-minute break, and then we're going in with the second half of the open mic. We got six more, or seven more great poets coming up if you want if you're going to take off our next show is uh in two weeks from tonight we've got another half open mic coming up please go show coco loves or coco flow some love and go show him some love at the bar and as always tip aggressively and receive rewards in heaven we'll be back in 15.